So this, I thought I'd reflect on metta practice because it's uh, this attitude of metta is uh, is very important, uh, especially towards oneself, because I notice most most of us are. Uh, very critical, and it, it's hard to develop equanimity or relate to a kind of the, the, the that balanced attitude of equanimity. If you if you basically don't like yourself or you're very critical of yourself. So it, it, uh, just in the West, where Buddhism is developing, people are, find Buddha rupas maybe a bit intimidating because they, you know, they 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 represent equanimity, really enlightened equanimity. So, it, to on a personal level, this can be quite intimidating because it uh, we admire it and uh, kind of. You know, feel it's it's wonderful and high, but we can't relate to it in terms of our own experience. So you can see a lot of interest in the Kuan Yin and and more kind of expressions of compassion as icons or symbols of compassion or metta, metta karuna. And mudita, the nupeka, of course, equanimity. Because in many ways we can relate to compassion. Like we're all good-hearted, usually feel compassion for the suffering of others, the animals and the downtrodden and the unfortunate ones it's not like a something that is alien to us most of us have a lot of that you know, wanting to help the poor or take care of the sick or the weak stand up for the human rights of the minorities and so forth So that that is that is an inspiring quality, and we can relate to it in terms of our own attitudes. Equanimity can remain like indifference. It's it's I'm above it all. The world just goes on according to its karma, and the poor are reaping the results of their karma, and the sick and the downtrodden and we can, and when you try to rationalize it in terms of equanimity, it sounds like uh, a lack of concern or not wanting to be bothered or just dismissing uh, the injustices and unfairnesses to abide in a state of blissful equanimity is how it might, we, we might rationalize it. And then towards oneself, this metta is the the starting point is ahang sukito home. So it says, "May I abide in well-being." Now putting that into practical practical into practice, what do you do? <laughs> you know, it's easy enough to say and you understand the idea of it. It's not difficult to to understand logically, intellectually. But right now, in the terms of this moment, what is it? Ahang Sukito Homi.
Now, is, is to see yourself as a pers- as a kind of monolithic personality that that is the same all the time is is another illusion. Is that I'm this person all the time. Ajahn Sumedho's like this, and I'm, you know, when I'm asleep or awake or when I'm working or sitting in meditation, when I'm teaching, when I'm playing, when I'm taking a bath or eating my food. I'm the same Ajahn Sumedho all the time. This is the assumption that that there's some kind of uh, solid personality uh, uh, is it's always the same. Notice that that is a that is a perception that we sometimes never question. We we it's easy to believe I'm just the same person from when I was born sixty seven years ago. I was born. I wasn't Ajahn Sumedho then. And I was a different. I wasn't didn't even have a name when I was born. And then my mother and father found a name for me. But it's the same person, isn't it? I, I can, we can assume that it's always the same. Or in terms of direct knowing, now you're, you're, you're not coming from the position of I am the same person. But what is person? What is personness or personality? And so that changes, isn't it? You, how you feel, how you think, the, the mood, the emotional state. Just in, in as, you, as you're aware of your personality, you can see it's a, there's nothing, nothing solid in it. It's very ephemeral and Fuzzy. I mean, most you can get a kind of solid personality sense of being a real person is when you're angry. You know, when you're feeling really, when you have the clarity of focusing your aversion on somebody, you kind of feel more together than when you're when, when you're not when you don't have a strong emotional state, kind of uncertain, insecure don't know what to do, wavering, then your your personality is, you know, you can't, it's so uh, amorphous, nebulous. Or lust, and one feels, you know, Sexual desire, one feels, comes together very strongly as a, you know, want, aiming at what, at some desired object. You, you feel pretty strong and focused as a person. A righteous indignation to be indignant about the injustices of the society and, and to, you know, really. Uh, harangue the society, you know, about how stupid and how unfair and unjust and terrible they are. To come from a righteous place, you know, it makes makes one feel very together, a sense of, of being a really strong character, rather than this weak, amorphous, uncertain wishy-washy thing. So metta then includes all of these different personalities. You know, that metta, ahang sukito homi, isn't, isn't ahang sukito homi in the sense of the, the assumption of me as a, per, a kind of uh, solid personality that's the same all the time. But it's uh, an attitude of acceptance, welcoming, non-criticalness, 
um, of all these different, this gamut, this range of emotional experience, emotional, intellectual, instinctual feelings, activities. So it gives this sense of a, of of a, embracing. You know, as I talk about welcoming, embracing, and this is this is metta, applied metta practice. Because it is, uh, it's not approval. It's not saying, it's not. N- making a value judgment or a moral judgment about anything, is it? It's just, it's like this, whatever, feeling wishy-washy, weak and stupid is like this, righteously indignant, arrogant, and as it is like this, being lustful, greedy, like this. And, and metta then allows these conditions that's not not saying when, when you when you start criticizing or preferring one over the other, then you're there's no there's no longer metta, and you're you're trying to get rid of the the things you don't like and try to hold on to the things you do. So then you're back in the realm of desire, the desire realm. So for me, like icons that tend to welcome uh, are can can be very uh, you know good reminders of this these Kuan Yin Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara icons, even though they're Mahayana, because we're not Mahayana, are we? Get into. Do we dare use Mahayana in Theravada, or is that is that spoiling the purity of our tradition? And get into into this kind of speculation again. But uh, recognize that that religious conventions are they're not pure. You know, they're conventional. So you're not going to find any purity in any convention. It's not a matter of of not spoiling the purity of our tradition. That can be another arrogant, uh, self-righteous position we take. But if if we feel that way, then we can be aware of our fear or our views about other uh, other traditions. The way we can just dismiss. It's easy, you know. I hear a lot of Theravadins dismiss Mahayana. Just because it's it's not Theravada, then we we just kind of well, it's not the real Buddha's teaching, and and dismiss it because our security depends on a kind of maybe an affirmation of our tradition as being somehow the best or the right one. But metta includes all of this, doesn't it? Our self right our fear, our our uh, anxiety, our insecurity. And then it's metta embraces and allows insecurity to be insecure or fear to be fearful. So when we say it's like this, it's this. This is just a way of 
allowing something we might resist a lot, allowing it to be conscious. It's like this, like fear is like this. That to me, when I say that to myself, it if I'm feeling frightened or threatened by something, then it helps me to remind myself to just accept this, this to to embrace this feeling of fear, to to allow it to be conscious rather than um, my my personality reaction would be to resist it, to try to get rid of it, see it as uh, something I've got to uh, get rid of, conquer, got to conquer my 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 arrogant side of my personality so wants to conquer because I in my my warrior positioning I don't want to be a frightened cowardly man pusillanimous pussy cat You know, my image, my masculine image is, is wants to, you know, wants to support myself as kind of brave, courageous, tough. And conqueror, the conqueror. So that's, one of, then, then there's another side, it is weak, frightened, pusillanimous. I don't like that, <laughs> and I don't want I don't want anybody to see that. You know, that when you the worldly life, I don't want anyone to see that. I pre- pre- present myself as a as a champion conqueror. This is the world, isn't it? This this uh, this conflict that we create. So metta then includes both. It's it's not it's not judging the the conquering energy and the as being something I shouldn't you know I shouldn't have or it's not judging the 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 weak, the, the cowardly side, the frightened uh, side. It's it's uh, being frightened and feeling weak. Is like this. A feeling brave and courageous is like this. So it's uh, it's reflecting on the way it is, the, the changing conditions are the way they are. So, like patient, like this, learning to accept things is takes patience to 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 allow misery and pain and and that doesn't mean like you're not conquering an attitude of conquering pain and conquering your weak weaknesses. That's not metta. That's that's the world again, worldly attitude. So, getting. Back to the meta practice of may I abide in well-being, well-being towards uh, all the, the conditions that that you might be experiencing. 
non-judging, taking an interest, uh, welcoming even weakness and worry, anxiety. So then this, this is uh, getting back to the, the Buddha in the Puto, this, I've used this as my lifetime mantra, Puto, and it's, uh, this is uh, like the Thai forest tradition, is their kind of, uh, the thing that they, I mean almost all the forest Ajahn teach, Ajahn Ban, Ajahn Cha. Is a mantric form of the Buddha, Bhutto. And this, uh, this, uh, and then translated as the one that knows, the one who knows, or the pure knowing, the awakened state of being. So the Bhutto is the pure pure consciousness, pure awareness. And so taking refuge in the Buddha is that we the Bhutangatanga Chami is, is this. To me this is what it means. Bhutto is a is a mantra. But it's not just a, a kind of uh, mesmerizing, hypnotizing use of a, of a word. You know, just kind of hypnotize myself with, with these two syllables. But it can be used as that. But also, it's to remind that what is the puto right now? So this is inquiring, self-inquiry. In terms of right now, what is the Buddha? Where is the Buddha? So this is like a question. And if it's just a, a belief in some historical figure, that's that's just uh, some kind of perception, isn't it? If you have you're holding to some perception of Buddha, which comes and goes. Perceptions of Buddha are like you know, you can study Buddhology and read the history of the Lord Buddha, and that. But that that's not that's only perception. That's sanya, sankara. So then what my mind does when I do this is it goes into this state of just awareness, this pure it's it's it, I find it naturally it, it it kind of settles into this like a settling effect. As I stop trying to find the Buddha and think about it and define it and question and get myself all in a twist around what is the Buddha? What is? Where is the Buddha? Uh, try to figure it out. Uh, as I just use it as a way of just being aware. The, 
uh, uh, settle into this pure state of pure consciousness. Where I can hear this uh, sound of silence. No, I kind of surrender to that. I'm just kind of release, relief. This attitude of of patience, of or this word surrender, or relaxation. Some people don't like the word surrender, but uh, uh, relaxation, relaxing. Trusting, uh, letting go of everything that you can just trust in this refuge of pure consciousness where there's awareness. Knowing, there's a, there's a knowing. But it's not focused on anything in particular. It's a not knowing about or or thinking about anything, but just uh, conscious attention that embraces this present moment completely and all that that appears in our consciousness. It's non-critical. So it embraces the body, isn't it? The the breath, the any any mood, thoughts, memories that you're experiencing now, it includes everything. Sight, sound, smell, taste, touch. It includes physical pain, or it includes bad moods. Uh, it includes good, good and bad, neutral, coarse and refined. Nothing, and everything it belongs. So this. This way of reflecting, and we don't have a, you know, just learning to trust, relax, and trust in, in the present moment. Simple as that. Nothing you have to do. Like, you don't have to spend your time trying to purify yourself and get rid of your desires and and uh, make yourself into a better person and and uh, try to prove yourself. And purify yourself, solve all your problems. All this this kind of thinking it it includes it. It even a metta for this kind of thinking. All these compulsive feelings of having to get something or become something that we're not, or get rid of our weaknesses, our anger, our bad thoughts. Or dirty thoughts, our selfishness. We've got to get rid of selfishness. So 
So notice that this 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 kind of this is uh, is dana, this gama dana, bhava dana, vipuva dana. Desire always has this this quality of there's something I've got to do, you know. I've got to I've got to get something I don't have yet. I've got to get rid of what I have that isn't any good. Uh, there's always this feeling of impending doom of there's something I've got to get. Got to get enlightened. I've got to practice harder. I've got to become. I've got to purify myself. I've got to get rid of my impurity. So this is. These are the the bawa dana vipavudanha that we easily identify or attach to, and and then it get intimidated all the time. You know, it's, it's endless, you know. It just goes on and on and on. You know, if you never get beyond dunha, you, even after years in the robe, you, you're never going to feel pure enough or good enough or wise enough. You know, that's why people get so discouraged because they, they, they put a lot of faith in becoming samanas and then they think that it's going to purify them. If you if you live celibate, if you eat vegetarian food, if you you know refrain from dancing, singing, uh, worldly activities, sensual indulgences, refrain from all that, and kind of make yourself into some kind of pure state of purity through through discipline. And so then we try and if we, we get caught into that then it's such a disappointment you know, trying to be good and and pure as a willful act. Because it's something in you dies too. You know, you go you go blank. You become kind of you know, depressed and lifeless. So, it's like the bhava dhanha, vipa dharma dhanha, three kinds of desire, is, is, and these desires recognize or to be welcomed. Like to to let go of desire doesn't mean you're you're annihilating it and destroying it. When when letting go of desire is not an attack, a, a, a demolishing, an annihilation of desire. It's 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 welcoming, accepting desire, knowing desire. Dunha is like this. Wanting to become something, wanting to become a, even a good monk or a good nun, or a, wanting to become an arahant, wanting to get rid of all your defilement. And these can be very righteous, you know, it seems right, doesn't it, to get rid of your defilement. It seems right to me, in my logical mind. You know, you should get rid of your bad habits, and you should develop good ones. You should develop skillful means, and you should uh, let go and get rid of your, your bad habits. You see, that's true. <laughs> I agree completely. But then that we're coming now out of the out of the intellectual, rational world toward the reality of this moment. That's the that's the kind of um, that's the, that comes out of the thinking process. So it's very dualistic. You know, you can't get perspective. 
you can't get the uh, you can't get perspective on things through thinking about them, through just following your thoughts. So that's why you have this true but not right, right but not true problem. You know, it's it's true. To develop skillful means is good and to let go and get rid of bad habits is is right. But now we're coming into a place of, of awareness rather than of reason and logic. So this is this is sati sampachanya, sati panya, intuitive awareness, which embraces, you know, it embraces this feeling. I've got to get something. I've got to purify myself. You can be aware of that as a trying to power uh, danha, isn't it? Wanting to become something. You know, wanting to attain something, wanting to, even if it's something very good, it's still bhava dhamma, as long as it's coming out of ignorance. Or vipava dhamma, trying to get rid of the bad habits of anger and jealousy, fear, trying to kill the kalesas, get rid of your defilement. It's like this. So I listen, you know, listen inwardly to uh, Gama Dhanha is quite simple enough, isn't it? Uh, wanting sense pleasure. <laughs> Just, uh, you know, the sense world, this world that we live in is sensual world. It's sensual, it's, uh, it's attractive and it's repulsive. You know, there's endless attractions through the senses. That's just natural. You know, that's the way it is. That's what is attractive is, 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 you know, one feels attracted towards what is attractive. It's just the way it is. <laughs> uh, but taking it personally, isn't it, is, is where it gets off the track. And being repelled by what is ugly and, and, uh, that is, is certainly natural. And, Wanting to get rid of pain and uh, physical pain and discomfort, not, but taking it in, but then we complicate it and we get into we shouldn't have sensual desires, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be attracted to the beautiful, uh, we shouldn't feel that you know sensual attraction is. Bad. We get into puritanism, uh, puritanical positions, or uh, whippa wadanha. I've got to get rid of sensual desires. I've got to get rid of lusts and greed and those nasty things that pull me into the sense world. All those attractive things and sensual pleasures. I've got to, I've got to destroy that kind of desires. Whip or dunha. So, so oh, if you're in, into that, you, you know, if your if your practice is around like asceticism, is a, is a whip or dunha approach. You know, so you, you, you just you're never you're, you're caught in the cycle all the time. You, there's no liberation as long as you believe in 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 this dualism of uh, I've got to get hold on to the good and get rid of the bad. So in the Sati Sampachanya, this tr- transcendent. Awareness. You can actually see these are these are mental conditions. Bawa dana vipa dana. We create them. They're aramana. They're they're objects 
mental objects, mental formations. So I can hear like the rantings, you know. No, I don't have this problem uh, because I've I've explored it so much for so many years. <laughs> but well, I've been a monk for thirty five, thirty six years now. I had a lot of time to to uh, investigate all this. But the, the the rantings used to be kind of a perpetual little blokey of trying to purify myself. And then the inner tyrant just ranting about, you know, any kind of foolish thought. Then, then I, couldn't, I couldn't even, you know, just dirty thought or small-mindedness, selfishness. Then, the, then this thing would say, you shouldn't. You've got to purify yourself. You've got to get rid of those kind of things. You've got to, you know, then you look at the other monks and you think, they don't have those problems. They're all so pure. Or you look at Lumpur Chan and you think, oh, he's so, he's pure. And, uh, and, and I'm not. And I've got to get rid of impurities and become pure. Then listening to this, scenario I'm impure and I've got to become pure what is that coming from that's a creation isn't it I'm creating those are words those are identities that I see myself as a person as a pure or impure person I've never been able to see myself as a pure person because my personality is basically impure. <laughs> Just the way it is. It's not. So I've given up trying to make have a pure personality. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a waste of time anyway. There's another delusion. So what is purity? Isn't in the personal, isn't, isn't by uh, becoming a pure person, is it? But it's purities, our natural pure consciousness, it's pure when we're, when we're trusting in awareness. We're, we're in a state of pure, a natural purity. It's not a personal attainment. I can't claim it as some kind of my, my purity doesn't make sense saying my purity as a, as a personal attainment. It doesn't, it's not like that. So, like desire, the desire realm is like this. And, and so, it's desire is a starting point. You know, like you, you're not trying to get rid of desire. We're not here to get rid of our desires. If you're here to get rid of your desires, then start see that as a, as some kind as a, you know, this is something you're creating. I'm somebody that has desires and I got to get rid of them. This is a, this is a, this note that this might be the, the assumption you're making about practice, about being a, a monk or a nun.
or desire is is to be you know like to be understood dukkha is to be understood desire is to be understood is to know it this is a desire realm this sense realm it's all about desire isn't it the beautiful the ugly the desire the beautiful and the desire to get rid of the ugly So the desire realm is we're not trying to to uh, demolish, not Armageddon and the kind of uh, annihilation of the world because it's bad, but knower of the world, loka we do. So the world desire, these are gods. He can be dukkha. There's they all mean the same thing, really. Suffering, dukkha, desire, the world. So the Buddha is not the destroyer of the world. We say, loka, we do. The knower of the world. So when you're Observing that even your your aspiration to get rid of your bad uh, your your weaknesses and your bad habits what is that you know like like really contemplate that what does it feel like the sense of wanting to get rid of something a feeling that you there's something wrong with you that you've got to get rid of it. Find out what's wrong and get rid of it. What is that like in terms of energetically at this moment? What is it like to feel this sense of I've got to get rid of something? I've got to change. I've got to get rid of my bad habits. And when I do this, then I I kind of I notice this. I, I deliberately think it, you know, I think it and listen to myself. I've got to get rid of my bad habits. And then there's awareness, and then there's this mental state of I've got something that I shouldn't have, I've got to get rid of it. That's a Buddha knowing the Dhamma, the seeing the, this Dhamma, this condition, Dhamma, as putting it as, as a sankhara and, 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 uh, and clinging to it or seeing it in terms of it's dhamma it's what arises ceases and if you stay with that feeling not, not try to you know, it's not analyzing yourself anymore, but just noticing there's something wrong with me, this feeling of something I've got to do, something I've got to get. It's like this. And if you, if you learn to embrace that feeling and welcome it, let it be the way it is, it drops away. That's the end of the world, the cessation of desire. And what is that like?
So then you, you cessation in the path, the uh, fourth noble truth. When you when you begin to realize and recognize the, the ending of conditions, it's a reality. It's not not a theory, and it's simple enough. Is if if you're patient and willing, and and uh, accepting, then things naturally cease. It's, it's not not me trying to get rid of them. It's the, it's the way it is, the cessation. And then the, we see the path, this way of awareness. Samaditi, Samma Sangapo, Samma Vaja, Samma Gamanto, Samma Chivo, Samma Vayamo, Samma Sati, Samma Samadhi. Put it into eight folds. I mean, this is eightfold path, but it is merely a moment of this awareness, Reali- the, realiz- re- the realization of something is something that we used to be attached to and identified with. It's it's gone now. It's, it's absent. There's a, there's still the puto, the awareness. But this is this awareness now isn't it's not attached to anything. It's not it's not a personal attainment. It's just very natural conscious relaxed state of being. So this is like in monastic life. In in anything like this that we we live in in this tradition, notice that we have our heroes and our icons of you know what really good monks are and so forth. And we have you know Ajahn Man and we have Ajahn Chah now as an icon. When you're dead, you become an icon. So. Uh, you know, he's. You have Ajahn Chah stories, and Ajahn Chah is like Ajahn Man stories. Who who knows what Ajahn Man was like as a human being? All you've got left is a is a kind of icon of him. So recognize that these these are inspired. These inspire the mind. <clears throat> And, and inspiration helps. It is like, you know, can, can give you a boost, gets you going. But it's not a refuge. You can't depend on inspiration as uh, something that's going to take you to enlightenment. So we can get intimidated. We think Ajahn Man, Ajahn Cha, or the Buddha. Or, uh, or the great, like the great teachers of the path. We, we can, you can even uh, see, you know, probably some of you project onto me all kinds of things, you know, of uh, kind of ideals and hopes. And when I die, if I don't screw it up before I die, then I'll become an icon. <laughs> And probably if I screw up, they'll become an icon. <laughs> but, but this is this is the 
you know, this is just the the sanya sankara. But then on a personal level, to compare yourselves to an icon is ridiculous, isn't it? So, I mean, you know, you, you can only feel you're not as good. I mean, you know, looking at the Buddha Rupa, uh, I can only feel... Uh, you know, I'm, not, I'm never going to look that good. So personally, I feel intimidated by that Buddha Rupa because it makes me feel inferior. <laughs> or is, is, is that, that's not what it's there for. You know, it's how we, uh, we can use icons but not grasp them. So we're not trying to become Ajahn Chahs or Ajahn Mans or Buddhas. Or we hear in the Tibetan tradition, they have all these, like Milarepa and then these kind of Padma Sambhava and, and uh, all these kind of marvelous figures of, that did all these fantastic ascetic practices, you know, living on nettle soup and living out in a cave and, and uh, doing all kinds of fantastic kind of, you know, physical endurance tests. We can feel very intimidated by all that. So what we can know is that, you know, if when we're presented with these with these icons of perfection or ideals of humanity, then how do you feel about it? You know, say if I say this is what you should be, you should be like Milarepa. Yeah. What you can know is what you feel when I say that. <laughs> and I mean that that's a, that's a direct knowing. That's something. That's the if you trust in that awareness of what you are feeling. So I'm, I'm maybe I'm intimidating you. <clears throat> I'm saying you should be like Ajahn Man, very strict, impeccable monk. And, and then you have these ideals of, you know, you're not very strict, you're not impeccable, I can't do it, I'm, you know, I'm not that, I'm not good enough, I'm not as good as Ajahn. That's a feeling, isn't it? If, you, if that intimidation, you feel a sense of being inferior, is like this. So this is what I'm trying to to encourage as, as, a, as a path is awareness. You know, it's, it's, to trust in it. It's something to trust in, in your, in your ability to know what you're feeling. With, and and not, not, a, not know about it in, in terms of what you should or shouldn't feel, but know that this is a feeling of, this feeling of being not good enough is like this. Or this feeling of being better than somebody else like this. Sometimes we feel we're superior to somebody. You know, I'm I'm much you know, I'm I keep the rules much better than, than you do. I'm I get up at two thirty in the morning. And do exercises. That makes me better than most of you. You can't do that. <laughs> so then the Ajahn Sumato groupies today, Ajahn Sumato gets up at 2.30 in the morning. We should get up at 2.30 in the morning. <laughs> I mean, how do you feel when, when somebody says that? You know, this is to trust in that awareness of what, what you are feeling and, and uh, whether it's, you know, you're, you're a party liner or you're a rebel or you're, you're just, uh, you feel, you know, in very intimidated or insecure by 
by all these uh, superlative examples, what you can know is that you, this is the way I'm feeling. The, the feeling, uh, the emotional reaction is like this. So that, that just pointing that out to trust that uh, is to me this is what I call developing the path, cultivating the what real pawana is when we talk about pawana in the Pali word pawana, uh, which is used in the four noble fourth noble truth. Uh, the eightfold there is the eightfold path, the way of non suffering. Uh, it should be cultivated or developed, which is bhavana. They use the word bhavana. So this is to me what bhavana is. And in Thailand they use bhavana is a word for meditation. In fact the the head monk at Wat Putapatip uh, the Tanjau Kun, the head monk at what the Thai temple in London, his name is Tanjau Kun Pawana. <laughs> so Pawana, this is this is Pawana. Pawana is not aesthetic, is it? It's not like fighting your defilements and and uh, trying to make yourself perfect, but it's awareness of this, this seeing this. N- Trusting, because you can't get behind it. You can only be this the awake, you know. Trust in awakened attention. And the the path then is being being able to see your, you know, what what you are to acknowledge and accept what you are. What is, what is conscious at this this moment? Through physical or emotional conditioning. 